Hey, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Sorry for the technological difficulties. <laughs> Looks like we're up and running. Um, so I just want to thank Pastor Clive for standing in last week on quite short notice. Um, it's, glad, it's good to be back. And uh, we've got a lot to get through today because I missed last week's lesson. So let's pray and then we can jump into it. Lord, thank you that we're here to study church history the history of what you've been doing throughout the ages, of your plan in action, Lord, as we are just the little pieces that you have privileged to be a part of that and to use in this process. And I pray as we learn what you have done um, through others and in others, and um, as we see the truth more clearly, may we love you more and may we serve you better. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so this morning, just before we start, I was actually so frustrated that I couldn't be here last week because you guys were starting to ask me some really good questions, and uh, that's a good sign, but one of the things that um, I just wanted to address is uh, my previous lesson, I said that uh, basically after the fourth Lateran Council that you can say that we can speak of the Roman Catholic Church as we know it today, and so somebody asked me, well, does that mean that uh, you know, the church was good up until that point and then it became bad, or how does it work? Well, the truth is, we look at the, the Bible, we'll see that even the Apostle Paul and, and John, in their day, were battling with false teaching and false belief. So, so these things were present right from the beginning. From the beginning, you had good and bad influences in the church. All right? um, many of these people were, were sincere in what they believed, even though they were wrong. Okay? So they were very zealous in preaching it and in um, teaching these things, but it turns out that they were wrong. Okay, and then... As you see, the third point, very importantly, the church fathers, who everybody quotes today, had no idea that they were going to be quoted, you know, 1,500 years later. Otherwise, they would have written much more clearly. They would have said, okay, what I mean is this, this, and this. What I don't mean is this, this, and this. Okay, but we, we don't have, they didn't have that luxury of knowing, okay, um, that they were going to be quoted. Okay, so a lot of the things, you'll see, for example, um, Augustine of Hippo, called Saint Augustine, um, read that quote from, from B.B. Warfield. He says that the Reformation, when you consider it, was simply the triumph of Augustine's doctrine of grace over Augustine's doctrine of the church. Okay, so Augustine contradicted himself in places. Okay, in some places he was, um, because he dealt with different um, heresies, and we can also look at in a few weeks' time, see why, on the one hand, you know, uh, some churches love him when he speaks about the church, because yes, he says what we believe about the church, but then when he speaks about grace, ooh, we don't like that, but other churches, yes, says, no, we like that part of it, okay? So, so we need to keep that in mind when we, when we think of when was the church good and bad. Well, it's always been, uh, God has always been at work, but there's always been good and bad influence in the church. So if we did this morning, we're going to look at today, the church today, Roman Catholic and uh, Orthodox beliefs and practices. So this is an incredibly broad topic, uh, I can teach an entire class just on what either of the churches believe. So this is going to be very simple. Um, it's going to be just hitting the highlights. And um, I've given you a lot of information in your notes so you can go and do some further study as well. So the most important thing is that we must always be graceful and, um, and generous when we are dealing with people we don't agree with. Okay? Because we want them to, to take our best arguments and see us in the best possible light. So we do the same with them. We don't go to their extremes and say, well, see... That person believes this, therefore all of them believe that. Okay, so we want to be gracious. We want to, um, and, and because there are sincere believers in those churches, some of the things we're going to look at this morning, you're going to say, well, that's just weird, or that's just, it's funny. But, but people really believe that. And if you go up to a person and say, well, your belief is just wacky, it's wrong, um, you know, you're not going to have any um, input in their lives. They're going to reject you. So, so we keep that in mind, that some people, even though some of these things might be um, yeah, unthinkable to us, people really believe them, and we should take that into account when we deal with them. Okay, just to click on the names, um, I've mentioned before that the word Catholic simply means universal or worldwide church. So um, the word orthodox means right teaching, or even better, it's right praise. So the idea is that you give the right teaching leads to the right praise of God. Okay, so those are good words. Okay, so I, I said there, so if we take the words in their proper meaning, then we here this morning are an orthodox Orthodox Catholic Church, okay? But, so don't let the names fool you. Those are good words. 
as just names that have been taken by certain churches for their own use. Okay, so number one we're going to look at this morning is Scripture. And look at Scripture. We've uh, briefly looked at it in um, some of the other classes that all three branches of Christianity accept the 39 book, books of the Old Testament and the 27 books of the New Testament as Scripture, but the Eastern Orthodox and the Roman Catholic churches both accept the apocryphal books, uh, which we would reject. Okay, These books were... Uh, so they formed part of the, the Greek Septuagint in, in the, that they were, um, they were paired with the books, but they were always seen as not scripture. But um, yeah, a lot of them take, the, take that as scripture today. Um, we see that uh, Jerome, who translated the Latin Vulgate, um, he actually went to Israel and he studied Hebrew with the rabbis. And so when he translated the Bible into Latin, he said, I, I don't want to do the apocryphal books because I know they're not scripture. But... He was overruled by church authorities. They said, no, we like these books. Put them in. Okay, so he put them in. So the Greek, Greek Orthodox used the uh, Greek Septuagint as their translation. So that includes the apocryphal books. And then the Latin Vulgate of the Roman Catholic Church also includes those apocryphal books. But there's also there's a difference in the, the role that the Bible plays and the authority that it carries. Okay. Protestants, we say we believe in sola scriptura. Sola Scriptura is that the Bible is the final authority on any uh, theological issue. Okay, we go to the Bible and that is our final authority. Yes, there's value to be found in the writings of the church fathers and in the councils and the creeds, but as far as they, uh, only, only as far as they agree with Scripture. Whenever they differ from Scripture or whether it's unclear, we stick with Scripture. What is called... Uh, he said, God breathed, the 2 Timothy 3, verse 16. Theonustos is the Greek. It's, it's God breathes. So only the Bible is the Word of God in that sense. But for the Eastern Orthodox and Catholics, they reject Sola Scriptura. They say, no, no, no. Um, it doesn't work that way. It's not that easy um, because, uh, you know, we've got the Bible, but who's going to tell us what the Bible means? Who's going to give us that inspiration, the... the, the um, infallible interpretation of what the Bible means. Okay, so they would go to say, yes, we believe in the Bible, the Bible is very important, but you need the traditions of the church, you need the teaching that's been passed on through the ages in order for you to properly understand um, what Scripture means. Okay. Tradition we, uh, means handing over, or a, a, the idea of transmitting something. So transmis the, the transmission or handing over this doctrine from generation to generation to generation, um, all the way from, they would believe, from the apostles up until today. Okay. Um, for Orthodox, they would say it's the uh, consensus of the church. So everybody in the church coming together and we agree, this is what the, the uh, Bible means, this is what this, the interpretation of this verse is. That's how they sort out the, their doctrine. Um, and in Roman Catholicism, they also have that to a degree, but they've got the Pope, and the Pope is the ultimate, he, he's got a special gift to interpret Scripture infallibly. Okay, so the Pope is the one that the Roman Catholics look to to tell them what Scripture means. Okay, so, we think of uh, what, what consensus of the Church, what does that mean when they say, they say we, we believe in the consensus of the Church? Well, it's the creeds, well, we're going to be looking at some of the creeds. We mentioned the, the, some of the creeds last time, the uh, Nicene Creed, um, the Apostles' Creed. Um, the decision of the church councils. Okay, So when the church councils got together and they decided something, that became an uh, official decision of the church. That's what the church believes. Uh, then um, apostolic succession is the idea, like I said, that you've got these beliefs that have been passed down from the apostles through certain people, um, the apostles appointed elders or bishops. Passed on to them, they appointed elders, and so you've got this long line of this doctrine being transmitted all the way, well, from the Roman Catholics would say, all the way from the Apostle Peter. The Orthodox would say it's from all the apostles, but specifically the Apostle Andrew, because they believe that Andrew was the founder of the church in Byzantium, which later became Constantinople. Okay? And... Uh, 
There's a critique that the Roman Catholics and the uh, Eastern Orthodox offer uh, of the Protestant view of Sola Scriptura, and that is that they say, well, if you can take the Bible and you can interpret it on your own, then everybody becomes their own pope. Okay? I can take the Bible and say, well, this verse means this to me, but you can come and say, no, 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 this verse means this to me. And you've got all these different, and, and it's basically just a free-for-all. Okay? And I think um, Protestants have been guilty of that. Okay? If we think of um, yeah, just so many people standing up and saying, well, I, you know, I, bef I believe the Lord is telling me that this verse means this, and then they go on with their thing. And, and somebody else would stand up and say, no, no, the Lord is telling me this verse means... Okay, so, so we have to take Scripture and... Um, and treat it very seriously, and look at what the Lord has given us. He's given us teachers. He's given us preachers. Um, there's a lot of resources that we can use. We can read books. We can um, make use of Bible software. Um, but we should treat the interpretation of Scripture as something serious, not just uh, me and my Bible and the Holy Spirit and whatever we come up with, that's what the Scripture says. Okay, and secondly, then, we look at what does salvation mean? What does salvation mean? Because there's differences um, in how the churches view the process of salvation, but also what salvation looks like. Now remember the Western tradition that I told you was, in the Latin tradition, very legal. Okay? So it very strong legal concepts of judgment and justification and wrath and sin and guilt and punishment and forgiveness. Augustine of Hippo, who we mentioned earlier, he did a lot of work on the idea of uh, original sin, taking what the Bible said and actually putting it into uh, com uh, compressed teaching, basically saying that human beings are born sinful as a result of Adam's sin. It's called this called original sin. Okay, it's com it's a, we commit sin against God from as soon as we are able. Okay, so we're born in sin and we start sinning as soon as we are able. Okay, therefore. We need a Savior. We need somebody to come and take our sins upon Himself and cleanse us from sin and unrighteousness. Okay, this is what we believe Jesus came to do on the cross. Through His resurrection, He opened up uh, the way to God through faith for us. Okay, so while uh, Roman Catholics and Protestants would agree that, um, as I said last time, that salvation is only possible because God first gave His grace, there's major um, disagreement in terms of, uh, is it by grace, alone, grace through faith alone, or is it by grace through faith and good works? Okay, we say no. The only thing that was required of us to do is to believe. Yes, good works are a result of this changed life that we live in Christ, but we, don't have, we can't bring anything to God to say, here are my good works, please accept me, um, and please save me. But the Roman Catholic Church, if we uh, want to read you a quote here from... The Council of Trent, this was now after the Reformation broke out. They got a council together to say, okay, well, how are we going to answer the Protestants and this idea of that we are saved by grace through faith alone? And one of the articles said this, If anyone saith that by faith alone the impious is justified in such wise as to mean that nothing else is required to cooperate in order to the obtaining of the grace of justification, um, I'll just go to the end. It says, let him be anathema. Okay. So the Roman Catholic Church, their official teaching is, if you believe that salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, you are anathema. Okay. It means to be, to be cursed, to be cast out. Uh, basically saying, you're certainly hell-bound if, if you believe this. Okay, so that's a, that's a radical disagreement that we've got with them. So, so any idea of us coming together and saying, let's just put our differences aside. Okay, you guys first... Uh, accept us back into the kingdom, and then we can talk about that, okay? But for us, uh, for them, we are outside the faith because we believe that. Okay, the salvation, we would say, is divided into three parts. It's there in your notes. Justification, sanctification, glorification. Okay, so justification is that moment when we believe we are um, declared uh, righteous, our sins are forgiven, and we are made free. Okay, but sanctification is, a <clears throat> is our life, the life we live in obedience to God, the battle against sin, um, and building our relationship with God. Glorification, then, is once we are made new, one day when we receive our resurrection bodies, and we will be completely made new, free from sin. 
But the Roman Catholics don't make a distinction between justification and sanctification. Okay, so once you become justified and your sins have been forgiven and you sin again, now there's a problem. Okay, because you had your, you had your chance. So now you have to do good works. You have to do all kinds of things to try and get yourself back into God's grace. Um, in Roman Catholicism, there are two types of sins. You've got venial sins and mortal sins. If you are, even if you are a Christian and you die having not repented of a mortal sin, you will go to hell. Okay, no matter what, uh, that is how serious this is. Okay, so um, there's no there's no assurance of salvation in Roman Catholicism. Okay, because there's any moment you could do something that could cost you. Uh, you've been going to church your whole life, you've been serving the Lord, but you could do something and you're cut off, and that's the end for you. We also have uh, now because we have this idea of you've 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 um, become saved, but now you've sinned. People struggled with guilt a lot. I mean, they struggled with their sin. Like how how can I be good enough for heaven? And that's actually how the doctrine of uh, purgatory started to be developed. People used to say, "Don't worry if you feel sinful, if you don't feel good enough for heaven. When when you die, you're going to a place where you're going to be purified by fire before you go to heaven." Now, this could this this purification by fire can last anything from a couple of years to millions of years. Okay, Some, some uh, people, they would say, are in there for millions and millions of years being cleansed of their sins before they go into the presence of the Lord. But if you think about what, what, what did Jesus do for us then? If, if we are made new and made righteous in Him, and then we have to go into this place where we have to be purified before we can go into heaven... It, it actually makes a mockery of what Jesus did for us. Okay, but this is the Catholic belief. Okay, so only the Pope has got the authority to, uh, to take people or to shorten your time in, in purgatory. So what do they call indulgences? They would say, okay, everybody who gives uh, X amount of money this year uh, for this program that we're doing, we will give you so many years off in purgatory. Or if you come and do this, if you come to the, the, the Vatican City and you crawl on your knees up and down the, the stairs a hundred times, you'll get so many years. It's, it's all these kind of works that you do to try and um, to shorten your time in pur- purgatory. Okay? So, this, so, um, so that's, what, that's what we have in the Roman Catholic Church, this heavy emphasis on sin and of not being good enough and of doing things to earn salvation. But in the Orthodox Church, this is completely missing. Okay? Remember we said that they are influenced by Greek philosophy. They spoke Greek. They didn't have these legal terms. So for them, um, they reject this idea of being born in sin. Okay, this original sin thing is... Okay, they, um, a lot of them don't like uh, St. Augustine because of this. They, they say, yes, he's a, doc- he's a saint in their church, but a lot of them would just prefer to call him a heretic and kick him out. Okay, so, so sin is not big in the, in the Orthodox Church. For them, salvation is all about the resurrection being made new, being made like God. Okay, that's the, the, the new creation is that when God comes to put things right, that's what salvation is all about. They speak about a process of uh, theosis. That it means becoming like God. Okay, so it's a weird, it's a weird term. You can study your notes. It's, it's a very mystical religion. Okay, but, but just to, important to understand that they don't have the same categories of sin that, that we would share with the Roman Catholics, even though we don't go as, as far as they do in some of their doctrines. Okay, I want to move quickly on to, to Mary and the saints. Okay, now I'm uh, going to test the theory. I've had, always had a theory that um, Pastor Clive makes Hendrick sit in front, so if somebody says something heretical, you could just take him out, you know, quickly. <laughs> so we're going to test that this morning. Because um, in the early church, there was a lot of discussion about who Jesus was. Most of the early church councils were to do with who was Jesus and how... Um, do we properly balance his, his divinity and his humanity? So, in so uh, during these debates, somebody asked a brilliant question. They asked, is Mary Theotokos? Is Mary the God-bearer? Literally, is Mary the mother of God? Okay, and the reason it's a brilliant question, because the answer to that question is yes. Okay, but, all right, but... When they asked the question originally, it, it had nothing to do with who Mary was. It had everything to do with who the baby in her womb was. So the, what, they wanted to, what they were trying to understand is, is the baby um, in Mary's womb, is it God and man, or is it just a man 
who became God at a later time. Okay? Remember uh, uh, that uh, first uh, chart I showed you, our friend Nestorius, he was the one who said, no, Jesus, um, Mary was the mother of Jesus, the man, but she was not the mother of Christ. Okay? So what you have is, you have uh, a human nature, and then later on you get the godly nature coming together, and you've got... Uh, Basically, two different, two separate persons living in one body. Whereas we would say, no, from the beginning, Jesus was 100% God, 100% man, two natures in one person. Okay. So his deity had always been there, but his humanity uh, came from Mary. But unfortunately, this term, the mother of God, uh, stuck. Okay. Uh, Mary became very, very prominent in the thinking of a lot of the early uh, theologians. There were a lot of reasons for this. It, there was a lot of pagan uh, religious influence on the church, especially after the church became the state religion. Um, people just brought those kind of ideas in with them as they became Christians. Um, the idea of mother and son um, cults. Uh, there was the influence of a non-canonical book called the Gospel of James. A lot of uh, that... Uh, icon I showed you was heavily based on the Proto-Evangelion or the Gospel of James. Okay, so that had a lot of influence, and there it speaks about uh, Mary being a, a virgin forever. Okay, we're going to look at that in a moment. But then also people always seek ways to, to, to bypass Jesus. Unfortunately, our hearts are that way, that if we can get it from somewhere else, we naturally tend to gravitate to somebody else. Okay, and so they gravitated to Mary, who they said is the mother of God, so therefore she's got a lot of influence with, with Jesus. And if you're in with Mary, then automatically you're in with Jesus. Okay, that's, that's how that works. So there are four what are called um, Marian dogmas. Okay, big words, but just means that it's uh, dogmas about Mary. And what a dogma is in the Roman Catholic Church is that is a belief that you must believe. Okay, if something is a dogma, you have to believe that in order to be saved. There's no... Uh, negotiating it. So, so first, the first dogma is there in your notes, you'll see is Mary as the mother of God. Okay, that was pretty early on and that was mostly in the good sense that I spoke about. But then came the perpetual virginity of Mary. The idea that Mary's womb was so sanctified that no other children were worthy of that womb. Okay? Um, she was so special and so set apart that she couldn't defile herself by having children or even having relations with Joseph, her husband. Okay, so they take this, I've, I've given you there this verse, Ezekiel 44, verse 2. Speaking about Mary, according to the, the, the Orthodox and the Roman Catholics, it says, speaking about Jerusalem here, it says, The Lord said to me, This gate shall be shut. It shall not be opened, and no man shall enter by it, because the Lord, the God of Israel, has entered by it. Therefore, it shall be shut. Okay, so that's the kind of lengths they go to to justify why Mary was a virgin uh, perpetually, never-ending virgin. All right? Then another one is the Immaculate Conception, the idea that Mary was born without the stain of original sin. Okay? God kept her from that, and so she was born without original sin. Now, this was only dogmatized in 1854. Okay? So for a lot of people in church history, this would have been an unknown idea. Okay? But this causes a lot of problems, because if God can cause somebody to be born without original sin, why doesn't he just let all of us not be born without original sin? Okay? We believe Jesus was born without original sin, but he was, um, he was obviously special, and he was God and man combined. He was not just a normal human being. The idea of normal human beings being born without sin is, um, just does not make sense biblically. And then last one is her bodily assumption into heaven. So the Roman Catholics uh, would believe that... Um, Mary was assumed into heaven. She didn't die. She was just taken up um, to be with the Lord. Okay? And this was only dogmatized in uh, 1950. Okay? So that's very, very recent. I've given you some other verses there to, uh, to look at as well where they would say that it refers to Mary. But I wanted to read you this prayer that, that people say, the Eastern Orthodox and Roman Catholics say, we don't worship Mary. Okay? We just venerate her. We honor her. She's got a special place. But listen to this prayer that is prayed um, often, regularly offered to Mary. It says, Remember, O most gracious Virgin Mary, that never was it known that anyone who fled to thy protection, implored thy help, or sought thy intercession, was left unaided. 
Inspired by this confidence, I flee unto thee, O virgin of virgins, my mother. To thee do I come. Before thee I stand, sinful and sorrowful, O mother of the word incarnate. Despise not my petitions, but in thy mercy hear and answer me. Amen. Okay, so that's, that looks like worship to me. Okay, <laughs> I'm going to be honest with you. That doesn't look to me like somebody honoring uh, somebody else. Okay, but I want to tell you something else. This is a, I don't know if you, if you, if you have watched the, the movie, The Passion of the Christ. Um, you would, I don't know if you have picked this up, but the thief on the cross that speaks to Jesus has got a brown uh, little sash or a pouch hanging around his neck. Okay, and the, the, the reason for that is because according to Catholic tradition, uh, well, let me firstly say, Jesus says to this man, today you will be with me in paradise. But that causes a problem for Roman Catholics because you have to first go to purgatory. Okay, you can't skip purgatory. You have to go through it. So they put this, this uh, little uh, brown uh, pouch on his neck, around his neck, because according to Catholic tradition, Mary appeared to a monk in the 14th century and said to them, if anybody dies wearing this um, pouch or this scapular around their neck, then they're guaranteed to go to heaven and Mary will come and uh, release them from purgatory on the first, I think it's the first Saturday after their death. Okay, so again, this makes a mockery of what Jesus said to him, today you'll be with me in paradise, but the only reason why is because he, was, he got the protection. Okay, he got Mary's look, looking out for him. Okay, so, so it's, uh, yeah, this really uh, is not a, it's not a healthy doctrine at all. And I, um, but if we quickly move on to, just quickly look at the saints. Okay, the saint, to be a saint just means to be holy. All right, so in, in the Roman Catholic and Eastern Orthodox churches, you've got saints, people who uh, have, by moral example, or by courage, or bravery, or dying for the gospel, or by living great spiritual lives, they become, um, they, they receive a place of honor among the God, peoples um, of God, a special place. Okay, so they... Um, they become intercessors. So they're in heaven right now interceding for believers. And you can pray to them um, to help you, okay, according to what these churches teach. Okay. So quickly, just becoming a, a, the process of becoming a saint, okay, that you have to wait at least five years until after the person has died. Then you have to verify that they did live a virtuous, godly life or that they have suffered uh, a death for the sake of Jesus. And then you have to have two verifiable miracles to have occurred because of their intercession. And I say verifiable because they really stretch that. I mean, it's uh, some of the, the miracles that they uh, attribute to the saints are, um, you know, it's really, really stretching it. There's no way you can verify what, what happened. But, um, and then also I just want to mention that this used to be quite a rare thing. If you, became, if you were canonized as a saint, that was, you had to really do something important. But in the last couple of years, um, Don Paul II canonized 428, 482 people, and the present Pope has canonized 898 people. Okay, so where it used to be a special, a special title that you held, now it's becoming almost meaningless. Okay, but the problem with all of this is that we are all saints. The Bible tells us we are saints. If you believe in Jesus Christ, if you belong to Him, you are a saint. Okay, so there's no distinction between well, the special saints over here and the rest over here. No, all of us are saints. Okay, if we think of church governance quickly, so I want to show you some, some pictures and things of it. So the Roman Catholic Church we would, is, is governed by the Pope. Okay, the Pope is the head of the church. Matthew 16, verse 18, Jesus said to Peter that you, um, you are Peter and on this rock I will build my church. Now, if you're going to read that passage carefully, it's speaking about G Peter confessed that Jesus Christ is the Lord, the Son of God, he's the, he's the Messiah. And that is what Jesus is referring to when he said, on this I will build my church. On this confession that I am the Messiah, that I am uh, the Savior. But for the uh, Roman Catholics, no, it's, uh, it's Peter. Peter is the one who Jesus said, I will build my church on you. And so all Peter's successors have been the popes. And the popes have got this special authority. They are the ones in charge of the Roman Catholic Church. Okay, in the Eastern Orthodox Church, you've got uh, um, what is called the, the person who's called the, uh, the Bishop of Constantinople. He's like the, he's like the, the figurehead of, the, um, of the, the, the church, but he doesn't have that authority that the Pope has. 
they've got uh, councils that come together. They decide um, he's, he's just basically one of four other bishops um, that come together. They decide things, and there's no, well, I'm the bishop, and I say, therefore, this is what it is. Okay. So we would say, no, we deny that there's, there's such an office as the Pope, and we would say, no, the church has always been governed by elders, pastors. That's the way the church should be governed. Okay, there might be some churches believe, okay, you can have a couple of uh, um, elders who are overseen by a bishop or a senior, but this idea that there's one person that speaks for the whole church um, is rejected by both the Protestants and the Eastern Orthodox. Okay, sacraments, just quickly. Um, most important is that when it comes to baptism, both the Eastern Orthodox and the Roman Catholics baptize babies for different reasons. For Roman Catholics, baptism washes away the stain of original sin okay, and regenerates you. But Catholics, they sprinkle their babies with water. But for Eastern Orthodox, baptism makes a baby born again, makes you a Christian. Um, but because they speak Greek, they know that to baptize means to immerse. Okay, so they take that baby and they dunk it under the water okay, three times in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, and in the name of the Holy Spirit. Okay, we would say no, baptism is, is reserved for those who have made a profession of faith and who believe and are able to articulate what Jesus has done for them and what the gospel means. But then the central part of a Roman Catholic um, or an Eastern Orthodox service is the Eucharist, or we, what we would call communion, but with some major differences. Okay, the most important one is that both Eastern Orthodox and Catholics believe that the bread and the wine become the literal body of Jesus and the literal blood of Jesus. Okay, it's not a, it's not a symbol. It's not a, it's the, this is what happens. It becomes the real one. It's basically, for the Roman Catholics, this is a, a sacrifice that's offered anew. Okay, Jesus is offered again for our sins. They call this the process of, of transubstantiation. And we'll look at uh, that in more detail later on. But the idea that the body and the, uh, the, the wine and the bread become the blood and the body of Jesus, but, but they don't stop looking like bread and wine. For the Eastern Orthodox, they would say, no, we, we, when we take of this literal body and blood of Jesus, we're taking of his uh, divine energies, okay, and that transforms us from the inside. Okay, it's making us more like God. Um, so they would say that this process is a mystery. They don't seek to understand or uh, describe how it works. Okay, but that's why the priests in these churches, they serve the communion to people because if you drop a crumb of bread or you spill a drop of wine, that's like you're spilling and wasting the body and blood of Jesus. Okay, so, um, so but this, this idea that you, can part, that you can give the literal body and blood of Jesus to people, that gave the, the church a lot of power because if you excommunicated someone, if you said to someone you are no longer part of the church, you're outside, then they lose this, um, this access to the body and blood of Jesus. And um, as we'll see, the, the church abused this power. Okay? They used it to get their way in a lot of things. Okay? Then there's some other, some other uh, things that I've given you, but just in conclusion, okay, we, can, we can learn a lot from many aspects of what these churches teach and how they operate, but because they reject the idea that salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, that means that they are preaching a different gospel than the gospel that the apostles preached. Okay? We also reject this idea that um, Jesus is continually being renewed, being um, sacrificed anew for our sins. Okay? We believe he died once in a perfect sacrifice. So we cannot therefore stand in unity with the Roman Catholic Church and with the Eastern Orthodox Church in the faith. Okay? Now that should greatly sadden us and we should pray for them and we should share the gospel with them. But I just want to say that it doesn't mean that there are not true believers in those churches. It's just that if they are in those churches then it's, uh, and they're true believers, then it's, it's actually in, in spite of the church and not because of the church. Okay? And we believe that as they come to realize the truth, they would leave that church and seek a biblical church. Okay, but let's look at some... Um, I actually missed this. This was supposed to be earlier. I've got a wrong slide in here. This was when I was speaking about the saints earlier. Um, 
Did you know that the term playing devil's advocate comes from the Roman Catholic Church? Okay. You hear that often in, in, uh, used everywhere, and that actually comes from the church. When somebody was, um, when they were assessing a life to see if this person was worthy of becoming a saint, they would call somebody in who can highlight their flaws and say, no, well, this person did this, and they had this sin, and they had this flaw, and they shouldn't be made a, a saint. Okay. And this um, famous example was of Mother Teresa. When she was being canonized, they brought in Christopher Hitchens, one of the, the new atheists, to be the devil's advocate. Okay? And while he was not successful, he, he remained a, a big critic of her throughout his life. Okay, so that's where the term devil's advocate comes from. Okay, so if we look at this, let's look at some pictures of, of these churches. So this is what the, um, that's uh, Bartholomew the first. He is the uh, current, the, the, um, the Bishop of Constantinople, the ecumenical patriarch of the church, of the Orthodox Church. So you'll see very colorful, all of these things that they're wearing has got symbolism as you, there's a lot of undergarments that you put on over these. And as you're putting these things on, you're supposed to meditate on the symbolism of what it means. There's some different, uh, the different Orthodox churches have got different flavors to their regalia. But you can see, very, very colorful. Um, and I would say that, these, that this idea comes from the priests in the Old Testament. You'd, the high priest had a special garment that he wore that had all kinds of symbolism on it. And so they would say um, that, yes, that, 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 is, that is how uh, the bishops and the elders should dress. Now, if you think of trying to make the argument that that is the way that the apostles and their followers dressed, okay, that's a bit, bit of a stretch. But, but they would say that this, that is the pattern that was set for us in the Old Testament. So very, very colorful, very vivid colors. Um, the Orthodox, the... the, the the mitri or the hat that they wear is generally based on a crown uh, because of the, uh, the emperor that uh, was the head of the church there in Constantinople. So if we look at the Roman regalia, it's uh, not as colorful, but a lot of uh, gold and sequences. And there's the pope with his cardinals. All right, so... That's what, what, it's, uh, what attracts a lot of people, maybe not in South Africa because we're not so aware of these churches, but um, a lot of our churches, these, especially modern churches, are everything is new, everything is contemporary. There's nothing that connects the church with history. And so a lot of people, when they see this, when they experience this, they go to a church, that, that they see this and they think, well, oh, this feels old. This feels like it's got some history and meaning behind it. So we should be careful of, of neglecting that. So um, just uh, some of the, what are called the, the, the rod of authority, the bishops. So you'll see the one with the two snakes, that is in the Eastern Orthodox Church. Generally the staff that uh, the bishops have there, it's because of the staff of, Mo of Moses, where Moses had the, the serpent on the staff that he um, held up for the people to look at. And also the idea of the, the bishop being the protector of the church. Enemy is always seeking to devour, but he stands as a defender of the church. Whereas in the Roman Catholic Church, you would have a staff that looks like a shepherd's staff. The idea of being a shepherd and looking and watching over people. Okay, the Pope himself does not have one of those. The Pope, uh, because he's in a higher authority, the idea of a shepherd being sort of too too low for them. They, they, he's like the, the higher shepherd of... So that's just uh, to give you an idea of what the stars are looking at. This is just for interest's sake, the, the Anglican Church, obviously split off from the Roman Catholic Church. So that is the Archbishop of Canterbury. So you see he's got, also got the fancy dress, but he, where he uses a shepherd's staff. Okay, so Protestants, I remember when I was young in the, in the Inchekerk, if the things got really, really serious, then the, the pastor would wear his Geneva gown. Okay, that's, that was the, as... Uh, how can I say, as uh, um, fancy as it got. Okay, it was a black robe, like a toga. Um, again, just to signify the seriousness of preaching the word, but um, today that's gone out of fashion a lot. So, then we, uh, we have got the sensing, that's basically putting incense and putting it in a little sensor and swinging it around. This is the idea that uh, it's both in the, the uh, Eastern Church and in the Roman Catholic Church to signify that uh, the Bible says that our prayers are like incense going up before the Lord. And so um, they would do that as a symbol. 
Did we see the Pope doing that in the Roman Catholic Church? But then if you go into a, a Catholic Church and you look, as you're walking in, what is the center of attention? What is the thing that draws your eye? What is the thing that you're looking at? It's the altar where you would have the, the, uh, the Eucharist, the communion. That's the center, central part of their service. Okay, there might be that you have a little pulpit on the side, um, but that's really secondary. What really matters at those churches is that you would have the Eucharist. This is just another example. So in the Orthodox Church, you have the same thing, except their altar is hidden behind these uh, panels. But again, you have the same idea. You walk in and that is what you look at. That's the first thing that hits you. It's, uh, there you have the... Uh, Patriarch on his throne, and there is the altar for the Eucharist. If you think of the Protestant churches, what's the center point? It's the center of attention as you walk in. It's the pulpit. Okay, the pulpit is there, not because the person standing behind the pulpit is important. Okay, unfortunately, over the years, a lot of people have got that idea. I'm the man because I'm standing behind the pulpit. I've got the authority, but it's actually to signify that the Word of God is central to what we do here. That is the highlight of our church service, is the, the reading from and preaching of the Word of God. Okay. So you look at famous, some famous Orthodox churches. The one with the uh, brightly colored one is the Russian Orthodox Church in uh, Moscow, St. Basil's Cathedral. Very, very famous. And then uh, this huge one. This is actually the biggest church in the world. It's the Hagia Sophia in modern-day Istanbul. Now, the, uh, these four minarets were added later by when the Muslims conquered the city. Um, but for, for many years, this was the largest church, the largest Christian church in the world. And what's wonderful about it is that when the Muslims conquered it and turned it into a mosque, they didn't destroy all the artwork inside. They just put curtains up. And so in later years, it became a, a museum. And you could actually go and go and look at all this. Uh, this was built in the, in the uh, 650s. Okay, so it's, it's very, very old. Um, but if you look at inside of an Orthodox church, okay, as you walk in, they're generally the, they have a dome inside or outside. And as you would walk in, as you'd look up, you'd see, here you have the saints, here you have the angels, and there you have Jesus in the middle, and it sort of draws you upwards. Okay, that's the, the idea is to sort of, you can see there, people sitting down, sitting down, you're looking up, and you're seeing these things, and you're sort of, the idea is to draw you upwards um, into fellowship with Jesus and with the saints and with the angels. Some lovely artwork. I could go on for hours and hours just showing you guys um, some of the artwork in these churches. If you look at famous Catholic churches, this is the um, St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. Um, it, it, the church itself is quite old, though. It's burned down a couple of times and been rebuilt and... Uh, uh, had some reconstruction work done on it over the years. And then before it burnt down, the uh, Notre Dame Cathedral in France, also a very, very famous church. It's beautiful architecture. I mean, just, you can just marvel at the, the, the workmanship and the craftsmanship that went into these buildings. So if you, if you look at inside a Roman Catholic church, in general, these churches are very high, high roofs, the idea is if you walk in, you feel you know, overwhelmed by your own smallness and by the, the majesty of God and um, all kinds of different, different shades of coloring. Um, again, very, very beautiful, but it sort of gives you a different, there's a different vibe that they're going for. Uh, whereas the Orthodox Church, like I say, is trying to get you to participate. This is trying to show you how small you are and how insignificant you are and how much you need God's grace. 